I think we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Real Talk, navigating the first few years of your online journalism career. Um, we're here, we're going to introduce ourselves, we're going to give you a little bit of advice, and then we're going to open up for questions. And this session is really contingent on you asking lots of questions, so please do. All right. Oh, so we're saying the advice after. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> So my name is Olga Hazan, and I'm a staff writer for The Atlantic Magazine uh, in DC, and I cover health and healthcare, and before that, I was at the Washington Post, uh, and before that, I was in grad school with Katie. Uh, and my one piece of advice for getting started in journalism would be to do whatever it is you want to do at the uh, most prominent place that will let you do it. Um, I'm Catherine, or Katie Cloutier. I'm a data producer at the Boston Globe, um, where I write about numbers, I create interactive graphics to go with stories about numbers, and I work with our reporting staff to teach them in basic Excel skills. Um, before that, I was a local news producer for Boston.com, which is the Globe's sister website. And prior to that, I covered crime and breaking news at the Erie Times News for about a year and a few months. And I also attended um, USC Annenberg for graduate school with Olga. Um, my piece of advice would be to ask for forgiveness, not permission, take chances, innovate, and if your bosses don't like it, you can always ask for forgiveness. Awesome. I'm uh, Wes Lowry. I'm a reporter for the Washington Post where I uh, typically cover Congress, uh, but often I'm also deployed for other national stories, uh, most recently in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, before joining the Post, where I started in February, I was at the Boston Globe. Uh, covering politics and breaking news, and then I also did a stint at the LA Times uh, where I did breaking news and politics and briefly some entertainment, which was lots of fun. Um, if I had one piece of advice, I, th I think a lot of it is to, I, when I look at the first few years of my career, I've spent a lot of my time working towards uh, longer term goals, and those goals have never really been outlet specific, they've never even been job specific, but I, I think a lot about um, you know, how do I want to see myself and see my career 10 and 20 years from now? How do I want to, how do I want someone to describe me 20 years from now? Uh, would they say he's an authoritative writer? Would they say uh, he's remarkably well sourced or very human, very genuine? Those are the types of things I think of. And so when I look at opportunities and I also look at the stories I tell and how I tell them, it's trying to build towards that description of me one day. Um, it's not necessarily about where my byline is or where I'm working. Um, it's much more so about Where's, what places are going to give me the opportunities to do those types of things. And so that's kind of, that's it. Great. Hi, I'm Christina Hartman. I'm the Senior Director of News at Newsy. Um, we do video for mobile, web, and OTTV. I manage content and production of a team of about 35 full-timers and 20 part-timers. Um, and I have to say, it's a really big honor to be sitting at the same table as Wes, Katie, and Olga. Um, because I graduated uh, five years ago, and four years of that I've spent at Newsy. And I have to say, back then, I could not even be sure that Newsy would still exist today, let alone have grown as much as it has. Um, so to kind of backtrack a little bit, um, 
I got my master's in journalism from the University of Missouri School of Journalism. Any tigers in the room? <laughs> All right, MIZ. <laughs> Um, and uh, I took a fellowship at CNN, where I worked in research for a Sunday morning political talk show. Um, I loved the work, but about a year in, I started getting calls from the founder of Newsy um, to come back uh, to Newsy. I had done some work uh, with my thesis at Newsy, and uh, I really started to get turned on by the idea of growing something from the ground up, but it was a huge bet. It was like, uh, do I work my way up um, at this big brand at CNN, um, or do I take a chance at what was at the time a, a, a no-name um, at Newsy and get to build something? Um, my mom thought I was crazy. I called her and she was like, no, 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 Krishi. No, no, you stay CNN. But, <laughs> but I, I uh, took the plunge, uh, and um, it has been the best decision of my life. Um, so my piece of advice would be, whether you are in a small, medium, or large organization, think like a startup. Um, journalism can be kind of a me industry, and by that I mean like my byline, my story, me. Um, and when I think of the startup mentality, I think we and team, and uh, some of our best, I should say, not some, all of our best ideas came from working as a team when editorial talked to product, when um, marketing talked to um, development, um, and there was less concern for who got uh, credit, but really more of a collaborative experience. Um, so lots of other great great um, attributes when, when I think of what thinking like a startup is, but that would be my piece of advice. Great, um, so please come on down to the mic if you have questions. Um, just to kind of get us started, you've noticed that we've talked about a lot of career moves. So I was wondering if I could just ask the panel what motivated your career moves, uh, why you made the, well, uh, Christina touched on it a little, but um, what, what made you make the choices you did? <laughs> um, so I, I really, I started at the Post um, and it was because I, came to ONA actually and I um, went to the career fair and like went up to the posts um, table and gave them my resume and my whole spiel and then I later like stalked them around the event like whenever they were together I would like come up and like butt in as though I was their friend and like you know start talking about myself in a really weird way <laughs> um, but it kind of worked out because they sent me like a job listing for this um, web producer job um, a few months later and you know it just it was for like this small business blog um, and it was a chance to kind of build something from the ground up and be involved in something um, you know kind of small within a much larger organization um, and so I was living in LA at the time and I just decided that it was a good enough opportunity and you know the chance to work with um, really great editors at a really great paper obviously um, and that I would just kind of go for it so I packed up my car and moved across the country um, <laughs> and I'm still in DC, and um, and then I just moved over to the Atlantic uh, two years ago. So yeah. Awesome. Well, when I think about my career decisions and the moves I make, um, it's been a, a good number of them in just a few years out of school. Um, you know, I started off. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Every I try to be really deliberate about the decisions I'm making, um, whether it's where I'm working or what my job is or how I do my job. And I think that. Um, for me, one of my big, larger, hierarchy goals is, you know, I want to be a reporter. I've always wanted to be a reporter. Um, and I want to be a reporter who got to write on race and, and ethnicity and politics at a national level and kind of the confluence of those things. And frankly, that's a job that only kind of maybe exists a little bit. There are one or two reporters who I can name who have that job. And so I knew that it was going to be kind of a tough path. And so as I thought through, how do I get a job like that? What components, what, what are the pieces of the recipe to become a reporter like that in 10 years or five years? Um, I started thinking of like, all right, well, I need local politics experience, and then I need national politics experience, maybe to have covered a campaign, but also I want to have been able to work in some of these communities. And so, um, you know, after, after college, I was accepted into a fellowship program with the LA Times, and I had the option of either starting it in the summer or waiting and starting it in September. And so at, at the time, I had been having some conversation with the Boston Globe. I talked to them. I ter previously turned down an internship offer from them, and I called them and essentially said, I, I'm going to be free this summer. 
uh, have you guys set your class yet? Are you having the opening? So I ended up going to Boston for a summer, knowing I wasn't going to end up there, knowing I was going to LA right afterwards. But that was just a really great experience of kind of doing a lot of the metro reporting in a community, doing some of the politics reporting in a community. Went off to LA where I got to do a lot of the exact same things, some big breaking stories, but also a lot of real community work and local politics. Um, and then the Globe called back and said, you know, we know you want to do politics. We've got a mayor's race coming up. Come do breaking news and politics for us. And I kind of wrestled for a little bit whether or not I would leave LA, um, which had uh, offered me an extension or if, and go back to Boston. And I went back to Boston to a smaller paper, a great paper, but a smaller paper um, in a little bit smaller of a job title, but a job title that was much closer to what I wanted to do. I knew I was going to be getting the experience that I wanted, and I knew that my goal was to be on the trail in 2016 or in 2014 for the midterms, that I needed to be spending 2012 and 2013 covering a mayor's race and a Senate race and a governor's race. And there's no way we could have known about the marathon bombings, which I covered a lot of, or the Aaron Hernandez case, which I was a reporter on, or any number of other kind of breaking stories that really helped over the course of that year me make the next step up to a national level. But in the same way, I had already been positioning myself specifically that the reason I'm in this Boston job is because this is the, the pathway I want to be on. And I think that that, um, when the Post came calling at, uh, about a year later after that, I was extremely resistant to the idea of leaving the Globe in part because I had a very specific plan, um, and it, that plan never had anything to do necessarily with working for the Washington Post or for you know any big name national place. It was much more so about the work I was doing. And so even when coming to the Post, um, for me it was very important to make sure I'd be in a position where I still was able to do the things that I wanted to do. And so again, I just think having, having some goal, and it doesn't have to be that specific, but having some goal or some overarching arc or theme is really vital to making sure you're making the right steps, or taking the right steps. Um, so I touched on the fact that, uh, you know, about a year in the founder of Newsy um, got really persistent um, with uh, weekly and sometimes daily phone calls. Um, but around that time, I had an opportunity to talk with um, who was at the time CNN's uh, deputy bureau chief, David Borman, who's now um, the president of Current, T Current TV. Um, and he shared a really interesting story about how when he was um, in his early 20s, he left CNN um, for a startup, um, which I don't think still uh, exists, but um, had characterized it as the most transformative learning experience of his life. Um, and around that time, we were starting to look at ratings reports that were coming in um, after the Sunday shows, and ratings were steadily going down. And I started feeling like, am I sitting on a sinking ship or am I sitting on um, something that is slowly becoming less and less relevant to people? Um, and that is not a knock on Sunday political talk shows. I still watch them. I think that fantastic journalism is done there. Um, but it really came down to, um, do I want to build something from the ground up, and I did. Um, so I packed up my two cats, which was all I owned at the time. Um, <laughs> um, okay, just another piece of advice. If you ever have to move across country with cats, put them in a cage. Do not let them roam free in your car. Dangerous. <laughs> um, but uh, so made that move, and at the time, uh, I and one other person made up the entire editorial team um, of Newsy. And since then, um, in four years, well, my husband and I, uh, fiance at the time, said, we're going to give this a year. Um, and each year that went by, growth was tremendous. We went from two full-time employees now to 35. We were acquired in January um, by the EW Scripps Company, uh, which believes in journalism with a capital J, just like we do. Um, and, uh, and putting out um, as many as 300 um, videos a week that are seen by tens of millions of people across the web and, and partnering with some of the biggest media brands in the world. Um, and I never, ever could have imagined that that's what would have happened um, when I chose to leave um, what felt like a very secure, um, predictable path. Um, for me, uh, probably the biggest move I made was from moving from Erie, PA, where I was a reporter, and that has, had always been what I'd wanted to do, to a producer position at Boston.com, 
And I did that in part because I wanted to live in Boston. I had gone to college there. I got my BA at um, BC. And I'm from New England, so it made a lot of sense. But for, it was also kind of almost a sacrifice for me because I had so long wanted to be a print reporter, a metro reporter, and I was shifting roles. I had online skills at the Erie Times News. If you can do online things, you will do them, as you, you'll find in smaller markets. You'll take on a lot of hats. Um, but I think what inspired me was I had the possibility of having a boss who, when I interviewed him, it was just, he was the most supportive man. And I think that led me through my time at Boston.com. He gave me permission to take on writing for the Globe. He gave me permission to get involved in these data projects with our data reporter, Matt Carroll, which ended up leading to my current position, a skill set that I didn't have when I started at the Boston Globe, and, or Boston.com, and that I was able to acquire. Um, so I think that's something to be really cognizant of when you're evaluating whether or not to take a position is the person you're going to be working for. If mm -hmm. he or she is a supportive boss, you will, and is invested in your growth, asks you what you want out of your career, what your goals are, instead of what you, just what you can do for them, that's a huge asset. Um, and I've been lucky at the Globe to have that. Hmm. Does anyone from the audience have any questions? Okay, we can keep going. I have lots of cat advice. <laughs> um, Oh, come on up to the mic. Um, well, first I have to say that I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania, so oh. having you be at the Erie Times News is kind of cool. <laughs> but I had a question. When you were there, did you like pitch larger projects? Like, Was there anything that you did to try and get the attention of like, a larger market? Yeah, so when I was in Erie, I had the very traditional cub reporter position. I covered crime and breaking news from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. Those are horrible hours, mm -hmm. and when you're 24 and living in a place that you're not from, it's tough. Um, but what I was able to do, because I had online skills, was I started making interactive maps for the website. I started a social media campaign. No one used Twitter when I got there. I taught them all how to use Twitter. I taught them how to use Facebook. Um, for me, it was actually a really good experience in learning what it would be like to be more of a managerial role because I was training employees. Um, and also, I was able to do some long-term projects. It was something that I had really talked about. I had a passion coming out of LA where I'd worked primarily reporting about South Central Los Angeles for writing about poverty. And I had told my bosses that, and that's what drew me to Erie. Erie has like a 30 plus percent poverty rate. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I got that bang for the buck. Like I want, that's what I wanted out of the career was to write about poverty. And so I definitely pushed the agenda a little. I think they would have been happy to let me have just written about crime and car accidents and all that fun stuff. But um, I wrote a long-term piece about ref the refugee population there, some other ones. So yeah, I mean, depending on your relationship with your boss, you might have to be a little more assertive. But I think, you know, as long as, especially if you're promised something, you should push for it. Um, so speaking of that, do you guys have any thoughts about small versus medium slash larger markets? What your experiences have been? I think most of you have worked primarily in larger markets. I feel like there's pluses and minuses because like the post, I felt like more people read everything I did um, for, for some of the stuff, but um, I feel like there's a little bit more of a community around the stuff that I write at the Atlantic. Like people like are like know who I am kind of a little bit more, just like in a very like very small way, but like I feel like that kind of matters to me. Like mm -hmm. when people tweet at me and they're like, I like your piece, as opposed to like, I have received this news update today. <laughs> like it doesn't matter who it's from. Um, and um, I think there's also like a little bit more room for um, mobility in a smaller news environment. Like I feel like if you have, if there's fewer people in your newsroom, you have a little bit more um, room to move around and to do different things and maybe switch beats and maybe try different kinds of jobs. Whereas, and sometimes in larger newsrooms, you might like there's not enough slots and like you can't move slots because it's not the time when we all move slots and like you you know th there's like these weird like structures in place that you just can't budge. Um, so there's like you kind of take a little bit of a hit maybe as far as like prestige or like impressing your aunt at Christmas time, but like <laughs> you like. I think you gain a lot also by, by moving to a smaller newsroom. And, and our newsroom isn't even that small, but, um, you know, and then as long as, like, like you're still, like, out there on the internet and, like, kind of making waves occasionally, people will, will find you. What 
advice would you have for those considering grad school? So I had a BA in English, and I actually came to the journalism game really late. I was a senior in college before I decided officially what I wanted to do. I had kind of dabbled. I had dabbled in some broadcast internships. I didn't really love those. Um, but I wasn't really steadfast until about my senior year of college. And at that point, I had very little experience and not a good likelihood of finding a job. So I went to grad school. It was a fantastic opportunity for me because I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to write a nut graph. I didn't know how to write a lead. Um, I went to a pretty supportive school uh, where I got the opportunity to, to, like I mentioned that project about South Central Los Angeles, I got to run a newsroom essentially, and it was really great experience in community journalism, which was an asset according to my uh, bosses about, um, they look for people who have community journalism skills. Um, but I mean, it's not for everyone. And I get this question a lot from the co-ops and the interns that work at the Globe. And if you're already in a journalism program, you're probably getting most of what you need. Um, if you're, I mean, an undergraduate journalism program. If you're not and you're curious about the profession, I think grad school is a really good option. We also, Katie and I graduated at a really bad time. Yeah. <laughs> we gradu I graduated in 2008, and you were, what, 2009? 2009, yeah. So it was like the recession, like journalism was like hit the hardest, and like just no one was hiring. It was like tumbleweeds, like when I would like send my resume out. Um, so there was like a kind of a, like overall lack of, lack of good options, but I think it ended up being a good option for both of us. But um, yeah, I think it kind of just depends on what your, your personal kind of picture looks like. I also think newsroom experience is probably the most important. So yeah. if you can get yourself in internships in great newsrooms, that's what you want to do as an undergrad or as a graduate student or as really just someone who's entering the field, you know, career change. Get yourself an internship and um, that's probably the best route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You went to grad school? Totally agree, yeah. I, I, I went to grad school myself, but I, uh, <laughs> it was good for me because it, it, it allowed me to figure out what I wanted to do. I also got a BA in English, and people were like, so you want to be a teacher? Or do you want to be <laughs> yeah. a, you know? Yeah. Um, I just really like reading books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to pay me to read? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I wasn't really sure what I, what I wanted to do. So grad school helped me uh, figure that out. Um, and then also, because um, of the Missouri method and the kind of hands-on um, uh, program at Mizzou, it got you news experience. It forced you to get newsroom experience. Um, so that's that, that's why it was valuable for me. But again, I, I, I would agree it's not for not for everyone. Also, context. It's good to meet people in the industry. That's how you get jobs. Yeah. So I barely went to class during undergrad. So there's no way I was going to grad school. That that didn't make any sense. Um, pay more money to not go to class. So. Um, but I think that a lot of, but I have a lot of, a lot of friends who've got, who've done grad school and done grad school programs. Um, I think that, I think that one of the things about journalism that's unique um, compared to some other fields is that we really all come at it from very different places or in different ways. We all have very different and individual pathways. Um, it's, it's not like I was out with one of my best friends from college last night who's in accounting and he has a very specific pathway. For him to be successful in his field, he has a very specific list of boxes he needs to check and things he needs to go. You go to this firm, then you go to this firm, you do this type of thing, then you do this other type of thing. We don't live in that world, and we increasingly don't live in that world because uh, you know the digital tools we have are in some ways an equalizer. Um, it allows you know, some of the best work or the most innovative work or the best ideas or the hardest workers in some ways to rise to the top and to rise to the top more quickly or in different ways. We don't necessarily have to weave through the bureaucracy of working in the field for 40 years before you get the job you want, eventually. And I think that, um, but I do think that while I didn't, especially because I definitely didn't do a, a grad school program, um, I think most of my education came in journalism came from the work I was doing, either at campus outlets or during the internships. And that's one of the things, anytime I talk to like undergrads especially, I think that's one of the biggest things that sometimes, um, sometimes our journalism schools do disservice because they stress classes more than they stress getting the professional experience. And I think that it's really, really important to be out there working in newsrooms. One, so you learn how to work in a newsroom. It's a weird kind of work environment, very different than most people's jobs. Um, w the more, you know, the other thing is writing and reporting are skills that have to be sharpened. And, you know, every time, I try to write every day because every day I'm better at writing than I was the day before. And the sooner you get into that type of habit, the better. My hundredth interview is going to be way better than my tenth interview was, which means my millionth interview is going to be like a billion times better than 
that's I got that math wrong, but you know it's <laughs> it's going to be a lot better. That's and so, but I, so I think that that's so, but so I think that's really important. I think that no matter what, whether it's through undergrad programs or graduate school programs, through internships, through co-ops, I think that coming up in this field, it's about getting as much experience as possible and really sharpening those skills um, as much as possible because that's what's going to open doors. Um, speaking of skill sets. Uh, what are some of the skills that you would recommend to people entering the field to have? Anyone can take it. I feel like our jobs are all really, are all really different. I mean, for, for like what I do, like for internet writing, you have to be good, you have to be fast, um, you have to have like interesting ideas that aren't just like straight, like what happened that day, you have to like have an interesting angle on everything. Um, and like a take kind of, even if it's not opinionated, you have to have like a, like some, something you bring to the table other than like a summary of the AP story. Um, and then I would say like almost as important as all those other things is just headline writing because increasingly our traffic comes from Facebook, which means our traffic comes from headlines. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you can't sell your story on Facebook, then it's not going to go anywhere and you're not going to have any readers and you're going to be sad. Um, I would say learn how to use Excel. That's, I mean, my particular interest, but it's so important, and so many journalists don't know how to do math for journalism. I mean, Excel will do the math for you. Um, and, I mean, especially now, and I think going forward, data journalism is going to play a huge role in the way we tell stories, and it, it's a really, I mean, they're also hiring for a lot of data journalism jobs. As a member of the NICAR listserv, I will tell you that if you know how to do data reporting, you are in a good position to get a job. Um, learn Excel. Don't say no to skill sets either. I think that's another thing that's kind of a, a issue. People are like, oh, I really want to focus on this one thing. Um, and that's great. You definitely want to hone your particular skill, but don't say no to learning. I mean, if you're a video person, After Effects, or um, if you're just a metro reporter learning Excel or basic data analysis, um, it's only going to make you better and it's only going to make you more marketable. I think that it, a lot of it breaks down to um, being in love with stories and in love with storytelling, uh, at least for me, you know, as a writer and a reporter. I think that very often we kind of fall into this pattern of, um, you know, the media kind of self-obsesses with itself sometimes. And so there's a bunch of reporters and we all write the same, we're all writing the same story, we all want to, you know, react and get, you know, get a post up on the same viral thing. And it, but I think that the content that um, in some ways rises to the top still um, are those unique pieces that can't be easily replicated by everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, for the most part, report on, on Congress, uh, where there are more than 100 reporters every single day covering Congress. And so I could write a brief on the exact same thing 99 other people are writing, or I can spend my day writing something completely different. And I, so I think that's really important. I mean, and there will always be those meat and potato stories you have to write and things you have to cover, but I think being cognizant of the fact that you know, part of what we do is tell stories, and you should be out there looking for the best stories. I, I remember my high school journalism teacher uh, once told me, like, you should be reading everything. Like, you walk around the high school every day, and all these signs are up, and there's stuff like that. Like, if you're constantly looking for information, or looking for stories, or looking for ideas, it means you are actively, constantly looking and paying attention to the things going on around you. I mean, I think that one of the things that's helped me um, as I've been, as I've tried to like sharpen my skills as a writer. Um, as I've advanced as a reporter, is really spending time listening to people and talking to people and remembering that the stories we write are supposed to be about people, um, either about uh, either interesting to those people or about interesting people. And so I think that uh, really letting yourself you know, fall in love sometimes with the things you're covering um, and, and not in the same kind of horse race way where we're just competing with other reporters, but actually getting to know the people you're writing about or covering, getting to know the community you're in, that's the thing that, one, is going to earn you the trust of the people you're covering, but two, is also going to help you see that story that every other reporter missed. And so I think that that um, writing and reporting and getting as much, this, I'm bro like a broken record, but like as much experience in those areas as possible, because once you have those basics down, you really can start branching out in a lot of different ways. But, w but I think it all comes back to that foundation of, of, of the basics. Yeah, the writing, the reporting, the math for journalists, the Excel sheets, the, those, those things are really important. FOIA requests. Yes, yeah, Freedom of Information Act, yeah, learn, exactly. Learn how to do that. And before all that, really, um, you know, I don't know if I'd call it a skill set, but more an attribute. Um, is curiosity. Um, I mean, the best story ideas 
come from you know being curious and you know looking at a headline or looking at something you're told and you know asking yourself what you know what isn't answered um, by this and that and that really comes from you know you have to be a curious person to be a successful journalist and, and come up with great ideas so. going up to the mic please Um, so going back briefly to the uh, job moves discussion from earlier, I guess, how do you know when you ought to move? Is that how do you know when you want to move? Yeah. How do you know when you should move, how, when you ought to move? I guess, um, so when I was first applying for a fellowship program at Annenberg, I met with the then director, Geneva Overholzer, and um, she told me just be open. And I think a lot of these opportunities present themselves to you, especially after you establish yourself in the field. Sometimes you have to go after. When I was in Erie, I knew that I didn't want to be there for longer than a year. So at about nine, 10 months, I started really applying places. And I came to ONA, I networked. When I was here, I remember I had like three job interviews in three days. Um, I really pushed it. But you'll know that too. If you're happy in a place, but a good opportunity comes around, I think it really behooves you to take advantage or at least seriously consider it. I, I think a lot of it goes back. I think you have to know your end game, one way or the other. Because I think that when I think of my like universe of friends and other young journalism friends, I think a lot of us fall into one of two different kind of categories. Those of us who have kind of longer term goals that aren't as specific, and people who have much more specific occupational goals. So I have friends who are like, I'm gonna work at the New York Times. Then they wanna work at the New York Times. That's what they wanna do, or, or they wanna work for CNN, or they wanna work for, you, you know, they, have a, they wanna work for Ebony or Sports Illustrated. They have very specific goals, and so for them, they are working very specifically towards certain occupational goals. Um, versus I fall into kind of a different category where it's much more so about specifically what I'm covering and how I'm doing the writing, and so for me, um, when I look at, you know, potentially considering a, a new position or moving from a job I'm in, a lot of it's about, okay, if my longer term goal is, is about being able to write with authority at a high level about specific topics, how does this news I'm in now, how is it serving that goal, and would, what would this move do? I think that you have to think, I think so often, um, especially as young people in this field where we've been told, like, you're not going to have any jobs, and they're not going to exist, and journalism's <laughs> dying, and the whole world's going to end, and it's terrible. We, we're trained, we're brainwashed, we're sabotaged to believe that our newsrooms love us as much as we love them, and they don't. Um, <laughs> like, they don't. They, they, they love us for what they can get out of us often, and the people there do love us. But I think that, but I think that we have to remember that, and I, and I think that so often we have to make sure that our newsrooms and our, any work situation are building into us the same way we're building into them. And that's one of the things I've loved about, and I say that, and I've loved every single place I've worked. Um, but I think that it's important to remember that at some point you would have hit a point where, okay, I feel as if I've maybe completed this experience. I've gotten the things I'm going to get out of this. I've contributed to the things I'm going to contribute here. And maybe it's time for a new or a different experience. And so I think that, you know, I think sometimes we come in with kind of preconceived notions. I'm going to stay at this place five years. I'm going to stay at this place two years. Or can I really leave? I don't know. I think that, again, a lot of it just goes back to the idea that, um, we all love the places we work and love our newsrooms and love the idea of that, um, but then the reality of like what reality is, which is that they don't love us like that. They, <laughs> we work there, and, and, and that we need to make decisions based on what's best for, for our careers and best for our journalism, because again, if it's about the journalism and about telling the stories, what it's about being in the position that's gonna best enable you to do the things that you're gonna find most gratifying. You know, I, I would have said when you don't feel challenged anymore but then I thought about it and I, I thought that feels too passive right like that feels like it's you know your employer's responsibility to challenge you um, and I don't I don't know that that's necessarily right um, I, I think that um, you have to really ask yourself have I contributed or do I have anything else to contribute um, I think that there is an expected path within any organization, and it's a mistake for supervisors especially to assume that um, you become a, a writer, a really good writer, um, a senior editor, a, a, some sort of manager, um, and, that, and not everybody wants to um, go on that 
career path, but if you don't, if you aren't uh, honest about uh, what you want and what you hope to contribute to um, an organization, then you you won't get that. You so, I guess I guess I'm in a very wordy way saying, uh, if you aren't, if if you're if you're considering it, also think about what more you know you could do. You could create another position within the place that you are. Um, you're not just kind of stuck doing what you're doing. If you don't speak up about what you want to do or what else you have to contribute, um, then you'll probably find yourself in the same trap the next place you go. Another thing that we don't normally talk about, because I think we all like to think that we do journalism like for free, is that we also have to think that you know we have to support ourselves and this is our livelihood. And I know I'm in a, a newsroom that's a union track and that at a certain point I will top out of my union scale and I have to think to myself, so if I want to progress both in my career and move up to, you know, be able to support a family one day, um, I need to make decisions that will financially make sense as well. Um, one, I was telling Olga this earlier, um, when I moved from Erie to Boston, I took a $1,000 raise because I didn't negotiate strongly enough for a higher, part, a higher point in my pay scale and my cost of living nearly doubled so, I mean, looking back on it, that was a horrible mistake. I should have factored in the cost of living. I should have been more forthright about what I needed to make in order to live in a city like Boston. It's very expensive, has a very high cost of living. Um, and I think that's definitely something to factor. I mean, you do need to consider where you're living and where you will be living if you take that new position and how much it costs and um, kind of the, the dollars and cents of the decision as well. Come right up to the mic. The reason I'm saying this is they're filming it, so we need everyone mic'd so we can hear your questions. And there's also these really bright lights right there, so we can't actually, we see, we can't actually see you at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> see me now? Is that yeah. Aaron? Yep. What's up? Uh, he, he, can, he can ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, like, what I'm hearing from, like, a lot of what you guys had spoken about was, like, career trajectory. And, like, Wes, you had mentioned that. Um, you know, we don't often deal, like, we as young people often don't want to deal with the bureaucracy of a company, right? And then you guys have also mentioned that, you know, sometimes if the position doesn't exist, you'll make it. Um, so this is, like, something I'm figuring out in my career. It's like, so we talk about this end game. Like, what is it, right? Like, news before, it was like, you work the stock room, then maybe you become a court reporter, and you slowly make your way up to the editor, maybe you end up starting the paper, and then you die, right? And that was, like, wonderful, right? But, like, that world doesn't exist anymore. And so I'm curious um, from you guys, like, what do you, like, where do we go from here? Like, add, like, say you do get to that job, like, then what? Do you become an editor? Do you pivot out to something else? Do you start a company? Like, what are some of the ideas you guys maybe have swirling in your head as you're, you know, pro progressing in your career? So I actually disagree a little bit with Wes on this. Um, just that I think you can have a different end game. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think you, your end game can change. Um, so I. When I first started at The Atlantic, the job that I have now didn't exist. Um, so I cover mostly health, but I also cover um, gender and kind of, especially as it relates to business issues. Um, and that wasn't a, a position that was that was there when I started. Um, and they, I just sort of asked if I could do it, and they said okay. Um, so at that point, my end game changed to, to do this. And you know, similarly, when I was at the Post, I had a, a mentor um, a editor who you know took me out for coffee, and he's like, well, like you know, what, what do you see yourself doing? You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to cover like Montgomery County schools or do you want to like be the Moscow bureau chief or like, you know, and I, I was just overwhelmed because at that point I was just trying to get to like the very next rung, like like the very next basic like job title. And I was like, oh, I have no idea. Like, oh, I don't know, like, you know. And, but I, I and at the time he sort of, like I sort of felt like I, I should have felt bad about that because I, I didn't have it all kind of charted out um, in that way. But I, you know, at the same time I feel like if I if I was on that course, I might not have ended up at the Atlantic. I might not have ended up, you know, doing what I do now, which I really like. So, I mean, I, I think you can kind of like get to a place, see, okay, what are the possible things that I can do from where I am? Do those things appeal? <laughs> and like, how do I how do I get into those things? Um, and it's okay if that if that changes, and you know, after you know a year or so, you're you're like, actually, this this is kind of like run its course, as you said. I mean, my career continues to surprise me. 
If you had asked me, well, I guess I started this thing in grad school about five years ago, that I would be, you know, if I was interested in doing data journalism, I would have told you I was bad at math, so no. Um, but here I am, five years later, doing data journalism. Um, I still don't think I'm that great at math, but I've learned to master Excel, so it does the math for me. Um, and I kind of like that. I like that, yeah, I mean, I have goals of being, you know, maybe an editor someday or managing people, but they're very vague, and I'm kind of winging it until I get there. I guess it's not very, like, straightforward advice, but I think being, letting yourself be open to what comes at you is a really good way to approach this mm -hmm. industry right now, because things are changing so quickly. Um, you have to be flexible. I think my position is a little um, different because I'm at what was a startup and is now an emerging growth company. And so when I think about, you know, the end game or the future, I don't necessarily think about it in terms of me. I think about it in terms of uh, how big and how far can we, um, me and my teammates, um, take this place that we've invested our lives in for the last um, couple of years. You know, we, we've, we've grown it this far. Um, we've taken it to acquisition, what's the next step? Every day, every month is uh, a new challenge and a new opportunity to, um, to grow our organization. And, 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 and with growing our organization, we grow. So um, on top of that, I'm a terrible planner, uh, personally. Um, so <laughs> I, I've never uh, you know, operated as you know, what, what my personal end game is, but um, truly being invested in the place that I am and, and seeing how far um, I and my colleagues can take it. I, I actually agree with everything Olga said, so I think I disagree with Wesley too. I, uh, <laughs> I think that, I, I do think that flexibility is really important, and I think that the flexibility of your pathway is, is extremely important because things change and people change. You get to a place, and then a year after being at that place, maybe it's not as great as you thought it was a year before you got to the place, or the day you got to the place. And so I think that that, I think that's really important. I think that, you know, to answer the question though, I think that as I think forward in terms of what's the next stage or what are the next stages or what do I want to be doing in five years or ten years, I do think that we live in an extremely unique time in media because there are so many different options. And it's it, in that previously it was a much more linear path. If you wanted to go be the Moscow Bureau Chief, it meant you had to work at one of these six places and you had to come up through a certain staff and put your 20 years in and then maybe you got to go for a year. And now, for all I know, I could get a fellowship tomorrow and go to Moscow. Um, you know, and I think that we live in a very different media world because of that. That if you look at the idea of what is success, it means so many different things. When previously it might have meant either you became a newspaper columnist or you became the local anchor or you became the editor of the paper. Now there are thousands of positions that could be defined as you being, you, that you made it, you did what you wanted to do. And so I think that, like I said, I think when, when I think forward, however many years, I think there are a lot of options, whether that's you know, some really, exar uh, really exciting startups that are popping up in our industry that are changing the way the industry works, whether it's some of the legacy organizations that I do think are starting to redefine. I think, you know, I think the Post is doing a really great job of that. I'm really excited about some of the stuff that I'm going to do with my team there. And um, I, the, the Globe, where I was before that, I think is doing remarkable in terms of hiring people and, and bringing new, exciting uh, journalism and journalists to a city that needs that. And so. Um, and then you have the models of people um, who've broken off and started their own thing that have the potential to kind of reshape journalism. And so I guess all that to say, there's no longer, there's no one definition of success in this field. There's no one definition of, of having made it. There's no one pie in the sky. Uh, we all have, and it goes back to, again, us all having very specific, very individual journeys. And so having some broad idea of what that is you want or what you like. Um, and that's going to change and alter over time, but having something that you're kind of driving for, I think, helps figure out what that end game might be for you, or what the next step might be for you. Okay, so some of us are, most, uh, some of us here are in journalism schools right now, so if you could just briefly tell about your experience within your journalism program, um, and I know some of us here might be disappointed in some of our programs, especially as they redefine and figure out exactly where the industry is going. Um, but then also a, a second part, part to that question is the liberal arts education, um, because you know journalism is more of a career-focused program, but how important is that liberal arts as well to that? So a loaded question there, but. Can I start? Sure. Um, 
could you could you maybe expand a little bit more on what um, what disappoints you about or what you what you think maybe disappoints? Yeah. So, for example, I go to a school where um, this is not being mean at all, but some of my professors are on the older side um, <laughs> and aren't necessarily up to date with everything online related. Um, and they might not offer the types of classes that, you know, I know Missouri does a really good job at, you know, getting you into the, uh, you know, the game early and getting those experiences. Um, but at my school, it's very just, you know, you, some people just sit there and take the classes and that's not, that's not the experience that they need for that. Um, and, you know, getting those internships and those co-ops and et cetera. Um, but they just don't have that support that some of those schools have, as well as teaching you those skills of, you know, Twitter, um, you know, basically, you know, how to do that, or, um, you know, any of those uh, thing link or any of those online things that you should know, um, but and how you can kind of counter that and do it on your own, or where can you get advice for that? Sure. So I think, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily have, have that experience at Mizzou. It's, you know, first and finest um, school of journalism in the country. Um, but even, <laughs> even there, um, uh, you know, I, I, at the time there were several tracks. There was a print, um, convergence, uh, broadcast magazine, um, and I, I went the broadcast route. And um, you know, I, I will say that as uh, as as up to date as Mizzou is, um, at the time I felt like um, there was a very traditional path pushed um, on you that said. Um, after school, you will go to the biggest market you can, and then as soon as your contract's up, you will go to the next biggest you can. Um, and I figured out <coughs> very quickly that I would not last if I had to do that. Um, but I don't, I don't blame the program for that. Um, I think that it is, uh, you know, any individual person's responsibility to to uh, get what they think they need out of the program and what they feel like they're missing, to be really, really in touch with um, uh, whether you're enjoying what you're learning um, and whether you think it's taking you there, um, and then and then rerouting yourself or finding um, additional opportunities <laughs> if, if you're not getting them from your program. You know, I, I think that when, when I think back to my time in undergrad, um, I got my you know, I, I learned how to do journalism in my college newspaper, and I got my education in class. Um, I didn't learn almost anything about journalism in class. Uh, that, that wasn't where I learned journalism. I learned journalism through the experience of doing journalism. Um, what I valued much more so about my college experiences was the classes I was taking and the subject matters that I was intensely interested in. Um, and again, for me, I, I know what I'm interested in, so that made it a little easy, but like my poli-sci classes, my African-American studies classes, like those classes really were, when I think back to like classes I loved in college, <coughs> that was it. And a few of the others, com law and, like, and things like that, but I think that you know, I never showed up to class to learn how to write a news story or to how to do an interview. Um, I showed up to my college newspaper to learn how to do that. And so I think that that, I think sometimes that's the, that's the struggle is this idea of you know, what is the obligation of the journalism school versus what are the obligations of, um, what is on you as the student to figure it out. I think that, because I think you raise a really good point about, especially with the way academia works uh, with tenured professors and, and the way it, it's very hard for a newspaper, a um, college faculty to quickly sh change as quickly as our industry has changed. If you think about it, 15 years ago, social media didn't exist. Uh, we didn't quite have 24-hour cable the way we have it now. Um, the idea of going live tweeting something was like nonsensical. Um, but how? But it takes a really long time for someone to go into academia and become tenured and be the person teaching your journalism news writing class. And so a lot of the people who are teaching these classes in colleges across the country, some of them have never worked in newsrooms with computers in them, much less with social media or live coverage. And so I think that that's something that you have to understand the limitations of some of the journalism schools and figure out, okay, if the school I'm at can't provide me this type of experience, what, what else here, whether it be through local media or college media, what else can provide me with those experiences? And, and that said, what can the professors who are here provide me? Is it the, the instruction in, these, in the depth of the field? Is it something like com law? Is it something like political science or women's studies or an area of interest where you can get your education in class but learn to do your journalism by doing journalism? Because really, that's the best way to do it anyway. Um, and if you're anything like me as a student, it was really hard. Like, I wasn't very good at homework, but I'm a lot better at deadlines. 
And so I was a lot, it was a lot, um, I would probably um, push off or maybe not even do the, the story I had to do for class, but I will always do the story for the college paper. And that was the way that I actually learned how to do it was by actually doing it and feeling like I was doing it. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I didn't really have any journalism skills when I went to journalism school, so grad school. Um, actually, the man who taught me how to write a net graph is taking a photo of me at this moment. Um, but uh, <laughs> so I actually have three journalism professors in this room, so yeah, it's, I, it's gonna be a little awkward to assess USC Annenberg. I had a great experience. <laughs> um, but I think one thing that I feel like I didn't take as good of advantage of is some of the investigative classes. And I know that a lot of journalism schools don't offer that many, and I think that's a huge hindrance. I think learning those skills, especially from adjunct faculty, so people who are not full-time academics, but people who are investigative reporters during the day and teaching this class at night is a huge, huge asset that you can really only get in a journalism school. Um, if learning how to make public records requests how to do the basic data journalism. Um, I wish I had learned more about that in journalism school. That would have been a really useful skill set. So I think journalism schools are trying. I know um, at BU, I've talked a lot to a professor, and she's trying to bring computer assisted reporting into the curriculum, but it's an uphill battle. They have, I mean, if journalism moves pretty quickly, but academia moves really slowly. So they have a lot of hurdles to face when they, they change curriculums. I know from working pretty closely with a professor that um, it's definitely challenging. Um, one thing I would say is don't bog yourself down in like learning every skill set. So, I mean, at Annenberg, a lot of what we did was here's one week how you edit audio, here's another week how we edit Final Cut, here's another in Final, edit video in Final Cut, here's another week how we make an audio slideshow. A lot of those skills I don't use in my day to day job. In fact, we have video producers who create all the videos. We have photographers who take all the photos. That, of course, varies. I'm in a large newsroom, so there are a lot of people who fulfill those roles. And in Erie, I did a lot more backpack journalism, as I think the term they call it. But um, figure out what you love and what you're good at, and really focus your experience on that. Um, and using, you know, like student newsrooms, um, that's a really good opportunity to focus. Um, but figure out what you love and try to do it early on because it's really going to shape your experience of journalism school. Yeah, I would just um, agree with that. I mean, we also have the like seminars with the 70 year old professors talking about Twitter, but you know, I, I mean, we, we also had like a wonderful news site and you know, that we wrote for all the time. And it was also just a really great chance to like, there, the, once you have a job, there's only so much you can mess up and not get fired. Like, but journalism school is a great opportunity to try stuff. Yeah. And even if it's really hard for you, and even if you're not good at it, and just mess up really terribly and not like really have any serious consequences to that happening. Like you yeah. just like wake up the next day and you're still in journalism school. Um, you know, <laughs> you completely plunk out. Um, you know, and so it's a good chance to be like, oh, well, I would like to try to, to do a story based on, you know, data, or I'd like to try to do a video or something. And even if you do it and it turns out really bad, but let's say you really liked it, you know, that could give you kind of an idea of what you want to do for your career. Um, I don't know, I didn't really know that I liked to write really long stories until I did it for, um, you know, in grad school, and now that's all I do, so. Also recognize, though, that there's not um, any journalism school that, or program that could predict every skill that you would need. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, st I studied production, and um, I, and I learned how to stack a show. Um, but I never could have known or foreseen that I would have ended up at a startup where we were doing video and we had to turn a former tanning salon into a studio with no money. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, here's a here's a, a a bunch of people who went to school to learn how to write uh, and and got to figure out how to get the smell of burnt skin out of this room and turn it into, <laughs> turn it into a, a, a studio um, worthy of being seen by tens of millions of people. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, you know, being flexible and understanding that your, your, the best jobs are gonna give you opportunities to pick up um, specific skills that, that you need and, and, and being open to that, so. Uh, so first of all, I'm Alex Kramer. I'm from the University of Oregon. I work with Emerald Media Group. Um, but I had a question about, I know we've been touching on newsroom <coughs> publications and stuff like that, which is uh, similar to US, that's where most of my experience comes from, not so much from the classroom. 
So I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about the journey from college like into the real world and like what, um, what things you need to adapt to and what it's like. Someone else start. <laughs> Um, so you you want to know about the transition into working full time? Yeah, are there any experiences or differences? So I kind of had a rude awakening in that I transitioned into really horrible hours. So I was very sleep deprived for the first year of my career. Um, I mean, I think what you learn when I was at Annenberg, anything we needed was just handed to us. When they decided that they wanted to teach video editing on Final Cut Pro instead of Avid miraculously over summer break there was just 40 plus Mac, piece, Mac <laughs> computers and a computer lab and what you're gonna find when you enter the real world is that or if you have not if you haven't already is um, that you're not gonna be handed the technology like that um, you're gonna have to make do with not so great technology with which as an online journalist is always trying um, we have a lovely content management system at the globe which does not is very unpredictable the method yes, method, yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you're, all of the kind of the assets that is grad school, the opportunities, the resources, a lot of those don't exist, especially in smaller markets. Um, so that was a huge transition. Also, just working and figuring out the, like how to manage your relationships with people is always very interesting in a newsroom. As what they said, a newsroom is a very unique place to work, um, and you have to be able to navigate those relationships as well, and that was kind of an uphill learning curve, um, and yeah, and yeah, I think that's all I got. <laughs> I would just say, like, the biggest difference for me was that in college or grad school, you're just talking with your professors, and they're just doing things, like, for you, something, like, you know, you're like, I would like to do this, can I do this, you know, they're giving you a grade, it's like very, it's like, kind of a really predictable exchange. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest change for me was, like, negotiation, which in journalism, you have to negotiate every single thing, like every single last detail, like your salary, your moving expenses, like am I going to get to do this, am I going to get to, how many stories, how many, like what about this, how much vacation, like I, I just, I mean maybe not so much in like union positions, but like in other jobs I feel like everything is sort of up for debate, and um, you have to be like really prepared to, to do all of that, and like read your lean in, and like do your sitting at the table or whatever, <laughs> because you, you're not going to have like I think you guys mentioned like, you know, these sort of, you know, benevolent sort of like newsroom overlords just like bestowing things upon you. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's really important. I think you have to fight for yourself, and, and not just in the, in the negotiate, not even just in getting the job, but even once you've arrived. I mean, no one tells you to take time off, and sometimes you need to take time off. No one tells you, no, you're actually sick. Go home. Like, and, and, and there's that big divorce because we go to this point where we're like, well, I'm not in college anymore. I can't just skip all my classes. I have to go to work today. And sometimes like, no, I actually, I shouldn't go to work today. But you have to be the person to tell yourself that. And I think the other thing is, um, you, you know, I think for me, transitionally, it was, I had, I had to hit a, hit a point where I had to make myself um, do other things as well. I think that it's very easy, like I said, especially coming up through college media, uh, where you spend a lot of time with those people doing college media, partying with the college media people. Like, it's very much a, your, your world and your ecosystem. You know all those people. Uh, and then you go into a real job, and while you still do befriend the people you work with, it's one segment of your life. And I think that that's important, it's balancing not only the work you do at work, also the work you do not at work, because we all do a lot of work outside of work. Um, and making sure that you really do have the more healthy, like, re real work-life balance. Because as you transition to being an adult, like you actually do like physically transition, like my metabolism slowed down a little bit, and so like maybe I should go for that run, maybe like you know like it, those things start becoming you, know, you have real bills and like student loans start kicking back in, and like you actually do have to transition into like the kind of the college lifestyle it can't exist forever. And while and so like I said, for me in some ways it felt like no, nothing had changed. I worked all the time in my college newspaper, now I work all the time in my real newspaper. Like everything had changed. And I think that that's part of it is just like actually going through that transition and making sure that in whatever position you're in, you've positioned yourself well to, uh, to be able to kind of cope with that and deal with that. I think the uh, biggest change for me was um, your feedback loop is, is totally different, right? Like when you're in school, um, you are getting very direct and very specific feedback by someone who you paid to do that. 
Um, and there is no you know, mincing words there or missed interpretation there. Um, you get very direct feedback. Granted, it's from one source, um, but you know, when you go out in the real world, uh, you know, the feedback loop absolutely changes. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to, to interpret or decide uh, you know, how, to, how, to, how to view the feedback you're getting from, from your readers or your viewers. Um, and, and whether something goes viral, is that really a measure of how good something was, or is that just a measure of how well you sold it? Um, so, so evaluating um, your work is, is really very different once you're, once you're in the real world and, um, as opposed to when you're in school. Great, um, this will be our last question. Uh, hi, Robin Lloyd from Scientific American. I'm wondering if you have any examples, and it kind of dovetails on what you were just talking about now, of uh, how you get higher ups to listen to you and pay attention to your ideas and help you get the things you need. I've, um, since I've gotten into my career, I've really tried to put myself in positions where I am um, organizing or managing people. I'm a delegate on our union board. I run the local chapter of ONA Boston. And I think putting yourself in positions, where leadership positions like that, put you in a better position to speak up at work. I mean, you can read all the Sheryl Sandberg you want, but if you don't have the confidence behind your voice, you're not going to speak up. So I think really ex going out of your way to expose yourself to union or to a leadership positions, um, even if you're early on in your career, is really going to impact your confidence and give you the strength and power to say, you know, I would really like to do this, or I really need more money or things like that. Yeah, I would just say also like that kind of, I mean it might be too late for this in some cases, but like picking your boss, like making mm -hmm. sure you have the kind of boss who will hear you when you say that you need to do something or that something needs to change um, and that you don't have to like, you know, do that all that much convincing. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is like bring in the data, bring in the analytics. Like when you write a story like the kind that you want to write, it does such and such, but when you do something that you don't want to do, it, it does whatever. I mean, showing them clear outcomes, you know, that kind of point to your solution, <laughs> preferably, um, you know, it can be effective. Um, you know, and I just think reasoning with them, coming up with alternatives, or, or trying to kind of understand, I think one of our, like, questions for ourselves was, like, understand the business side. Like, I actually think that could be helpful, because, like, if you know the constraints that your bosses are working under, like, if they, like, just don't have any money until the next quarter, and you know when the next quarter starts, then you know on day one of the next quarter you're going to be in their office, you know. Like, it's just, it, it's helpful to know kind of what their perspective, so that you can kind of navigate around that and then still come up with things that, that work for you. Here's where I think um, maybe... This might be a, a referendum on a, on a smaller organization because um, I have the privilege of being at an organization where it's sort of a, a, f a flat hierarchy as opposed to like this very, very, you know, like people over here don't know the people over here and vice versa. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I never have um, felt like I have difficulty being heard. Um, and um, I, I f our our management knows our our part timers, our interns, um, and so I, that I think is 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 one of the advantages of being at a smaller organization. I think that for me, I, I think I have two thoughts on that. I think one is I think it's really important to have credibility inside your newsroom. Uh, I think that um, especially especially in the. If, when you're on the younger side, just coming into a newsroom or in your first five years in the job or and the, being the low guy in the totem pole, I think it's important that, you know, when you speak, what you're saying is, like, one, true, but also is something that matters and is important. And so, like, when I take the job at the Washington Post, like, I'm on the national political staff at the Washington Post. Like, if I sit in this Monday meeting with, like, all the top political writers of the country and I'm sitting here, like, what in the world am I doing in this meeting? I don't know what we're talking about. Um, and so I very much have tried to adopt the posture of I shut up and listen. Um, and I'm someone who likes to talk, and I like to talk in meetings, and I like to plan, and I like journalism, I think I know what I'm talking about sometimes, but I like to sit down and shut up and listen to the staff, but what that means is when I speak up in a meeting, everyone goes, oh, oh, he's talking, what's going on, well, I wonder what he's going to say. And so I try to in some ways choose my battles, and then that can be an increasing level of credibility. Um, and I think the other thing too is I think sometimes when you're valued outside of your newsroom, it forces your, your newsroom to value you more. Um, I think that I think that's really important um, that 
when you're kind of active in journalism more broadly, or at, whether that be through organizations, whether that be um, you know through local or national organizations, or even just in some ways the interactions we have on social media. When, when you're someone who is known and is valued, it in some ways forces the newsroom to pay attention to you and to value you because other people are paying attention to you and valuing you. And so I think that that is another big component um, to that. And um, but again, the the biggest, the best thing is pick, being really cognizant about the bosses, the people you work for. And I've been really fortunate to, been, to have loved all the bosses I've worked for, in part because I've deliberately chosen bosses when I've had the opportunity who I know would be look, are going to be looking out for me and who I'm going to have an open voice with. And so I think that's important. I also think, though, that being heard, the best way to be heard is to spot needs and fill them as opposed to um, like stomping your feet or talking louder. Um, when I was at CNN, I, I used, and we were talking about this earlier, like do you, do you pigeon, pigeonhole yourself, but I used time, if I had any extra, to like pick up the coffee mugs um, um, on the set after the show or um, to put people's like coffee mugs away or to backstop the copy editors when the show was live. Um, because I think that you know when people see that you're a person who can um, help them or is helping people who are helping them, um, then you're, you're recognized as someone who sees needs and, and fills them. And then, um, you know, essentially you're, you're, you're earning an ear um, as opposed to, you know, just talking louder. Great. Uh, thank you all for coming.